Welcome to the Psychedelic Support Network interview series. Psychedelic Support is the leading directory of licensed mental health practitioners and community groups who provide mental health services related to psychedelic medicine and integration, both online and in person. You can learn more about our work at psychedelic.support. Joining me today is Dr. Nicholas Grunman, founder of Ember Health. Ember Health provides IV infusions of ketamine in a safe, medically monitored setting to people seeking relief from depression. Dr. Grunman is an emergency medicine physician by training, devoted to improving how healthcare systems operate for those who need it most. Dr. Grunman co-founded Ember Health as a way to help individuals take control of their lives and to contribute in sh to shaping the field in line with his values. We are so grateful to have you here today. Dr. Nicholas Grunman, thank you so much for joining me. Good morning. Good morning. So I want to dive right in. You have had such a fascinating career and the work you do now weaves together so many different values. Um, I wonder what brought you to doing this kind of mental health work? Sure. Um, I had a bit of a, an eclectic path uh, to get here with Ember. Um, by training, as you mentioned, I'm an emergency medicine physician. Uh, so for almost a decade, was very used to working in an ER, um, being where people with depression would come for not the ideal reasons, um, particularly for those who are suicidal, um, for those suffering from uh, pretty significant burdens from their disease. Um, there's also this fact in the ER world that uh, something like 30% of all ER visits are from people who also have depression. So they're not there because they're depressed, but they're there for chest pain that is more bothersome to them because of their depression. So uh, mental health kind of uh, significantly over-rotates in terms of the people who show up uh, into the emergency department on a regular basis. So I had that whole part of my brain, um, that whole kind of part of my daily life. Um, and then we also use ketamine in the emergency department on a daily basis. It's our uh, default anesthetic uh, medication for conscious sedation, so to put people to sleep if we need to do procedures. And it's really safe, um, particularly in busy urban settings. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say that we use it multiple times a day and actually use it in doses that are functionally close to a hundred fold higher than the doses now used in mental health. Uh, so with those two parts of my brain, um, I was also being exposed to all of this research that was coming out for ketamine, where uh, it was being shown how deeply effective this was for people and at least in that ER world that first started coming up with acute suicidality. And there have been a handful of papers now showing that ketamine has a rapid um, reduction, or causes a rapid reduction in suicidal thinking. The more I looked into the literature, the more I saw that this was a, a real thing, not just a theory. Um, and that led my wife and I to talk about how we could make this more accessible because we kind of looked around in New York City and there were some options. Um, but we felt like there was an opportunity to bring this uh, to a more common place where people could actually access it um, without some of the logistical and, and significant hurdles that they otherwise faced in receiving it. Um, fast forward f almost four years later, and we now have three op uh, two offices open and running here in New York City, with a third office in the Upper East Side that's due to open this fall. Uh, there are uh, three doctors actively working on the team. A fourth one is joining uh, this fall as well. Um, and we've run a couple thousand infusions for people over these last couple of years um, because it does work. Um, and we've seen that kind of day in, day out. It uh, started with an idea, started with seeing a few clients myself directly, um, and have since grown from there. Wow, that is absolutely incredible. Um... And it's so wonderful to to hear how you evolved, you know, from being in the emergency room and seeing some of these connected symptoms come into the space and then seeing that there could be maybe more effective treatments to really help people regain control of their lives and, and have an improved quality of life. Absolutely. Um, so I know, you know, ketamine, um, ketamine is, is indicated for treating depression. I wonder if you can tell us more, how does ketamine work for treating depression? And how does this differ from um, traditional antidepressants that might be prescribed more commonly? Yeah, uh, it's actually what makes this field really fun to work in. Um, ketamine is really different. And actually most of our understanding of what ketamine actually does is relatively recent. Um, if you look at, as you can probably tell, I'm a bit of a data nerd. If you, if you look at the actual published studies on ketamine for depression, these um, 
medical clinical trials, it looks uh, exponential. Uh, the last three years, say, have had more papers published in the last 20. Um, and from that, we've actually learned a ton of information. Um, so most of this data is intravenous ketamine done as a slow infusion and specific for depression or even more specifically treatment-resistant depression. So people who have tried other medications, tried other uh, things like TMS or ECT and still not found relief. Um, and what we've learned uh, from those papers and from our clients, in fact, is that ketamine actually has three distinct, three different things that it does. And if you have a practice that focuses on all three of these things, you actually see markedly better outcomes than if you focus on any one of them. Uh, ketamine's first effect is just biological. It's why this can be done in a clinical trial and still see positive outcomes. Um, give the drug to the right person in the right route of delivery over the right period of time at the right frequency at the right dose. There are a lot of clinical variables that need to be done very carefully. But when those things are lined up correctly, what happens is that three out of four of them experience a reset of their emotional reward system. So the part of the brain that tells you how you're supposed to feel about events as they're occurring. And when a person is depressed, that system just defaults to negative. It spits out sad, bad, uh, anhedonic, or apathetic. And that's true despite what a person might be doing um, in activities in, in their life. And when these treatments kick in, people don't feel happy. That's never the goal of this. People feel neutral, and they kind of wake up feeling OK. But then from neutral, they're able to experience emotions that are appropriate to what's actually going on around them. So they do something that just objectively should make them feel happy or rewarded, and they get to feel that often for the first time mm -hmm. in years. And similarly, this doesn't prevent negative emotions. So that biologic change isn't a blunting mechanism. If something sad happens, they feel sad. And that's, that's an appropriate response at times. But it does certainly help them prevent that rumination, that kind of spiraling down from single negative events because that system is just spitting out inappropriate things. Uh, ketamine's second effect is much more psychological in nature. Um, people often talk about psychedelic in this world. Dissociative is another term that gets used a lot in the clinical literature, the altered states of consciousness. Uh, what matters is that people are expected to have an experience. People are expected to be thinking and feeling differently for the time that they're having the treatment administered while they're in our office in this case. And there is now data, there's now a couple of, about a half dozen clinical papers that have shown that how that experience goes actually correlates to, uh, changes the outcome of how somebody is going to do. Change is a little hard to prove there, but certainly makes a difference from everything that we've heard from every person who's gone through this. Uh, what happens psychologically is that the sessions themselves often provide psychological content, things people can talk about, and those feel valuable to the person. Uh, these are things like insights, changes in perspective, uh, reframing of some of the trauma or issues that they've been through in their own life. And there are thousands of different ways of describing what that's like. Each of our clients talks about this differently. We interview with them. In fact, we talk to every client after every session quite extensively. And I can tell you, I've done thousands of these myself, no two people describe uh, their sessions the same. Nor do they describe, each person describes each session differently. Uh, because this is a bit about that person's brain, that person's thought on that particular day. Uh, but the point of the psychological side of things is that we can do things to influence it. We can create spaces that are comforting. We can have providers by a person at all times for support. Uh, we can do things in our practice at Ember like aromatherapy and music therapy and intention setting that make it more likely that a person has psychologically fruitful content come up. And so we do that because it actually makes a difference for that experiential side of things. And then the final effect of ketamine, what kind of ties all of this together, is that for a couple of weeks after each IV treatment, a person becomes more neuroplastic. Uh, quite literally a time that they can change their thinking, they can grow their neural connections more easily. This is where things like Michael Pollan's book, uh, How to Change Your Mind, come from, is that there are these windows each time where a person is better able to break bad habits, they're better able to form new habits, and if they're focused on it, supportive habits. And psychotherapy itself becomes more effective. That's a measurable clinical statement at this point. Um, Yale just published yet another study showing CBT is specifically adaptive, specifically helpful. And anything that is considered adaptive learning has been really shown to be positively beneficial post-ketamine because the ketamine itself makes those techniques stickier. And a lot of our clients use that language. They talk about getting unstuck from where they've been as they go through this process. 
Um, our opinion is that practices really should combine those three things. They're not distinct in the sense that a client can benefit from all three of them. And they're all provided when you do this treatment correctly. So our practice really hones in on doing the biological side of things as kind of evidence-based technically as uh, technical standards as possible. We deeply focus on the experience. We don't ignore that. We emphasize that. And then we try to set things up so that the experience itself is therapeutic and beneficial. And finally, we partner with people as mental health care providers. So no client at Ember comes to us in isolation of a larger healthcare team. Uh, they have to have either a therapist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist as part of the team. And we work with those people in a care coordinated fashion to ensure that the clients are best supported in the long run. So they have the benefit of what they do with us combined with using this as a platform for some more longer term and structural changes that might help shift some of the very reasons that they're triggered in depression in the first place. So we talk about that last part is the ecosystem of care. That was a long answer. This um, can get very technical very quickly, but those three things tend to be the current explanations as we see it for how ketamine actually achieves what it does. Oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you for, for walking me through that. I think, um... Uh, also what you mentioned, you know, those those three aspects and how you bring those into the, the ecosystem of care that Ember offers um, was something I, I had wanted to explore a little bit with you. Um, and I, you know, I, I also appreciate that uh, you touched on the conversations, you know, that are coming up, things like Michael Pollan's book and some of the different terminology that folks use. Um, I wanted to get to ask you, are, you know, with this growing interest in ketamine that we really we see sort of from, from all angles, from the public, from the research side, from physicians, mental health care, um, the language seems to be really important in, in these treatments. So I wonder if you could share more about, um, you know, how the language we use to describe treatment can shape how receptive or comfortable someone might be in accessing and using these services. Yeah, I think that, that actually that last statement is exactly how we think of this. So in our mind here at Ember, um, language around how we talk about this treatment is an access issue. Um, only about a third of our clients uh, approach us from a psychedelic orientation, have ideas about how this might have changes in their altered states of consciousness that might be helpful to them. The majority of our clients come to us from more traditional, so to speak, psychiatric practices, or simply as the next step in trying to address the depression. And that's because this is a clinically indicated next step for people who have been suffering. And that's how we focus on it, is that we're not a practice that provides ketamine, we're not a practice that focuses on psychedelics, we are a treatment center for people who are suffering uh, to be able to access a tool that is otherwise difficult to find. That means that all of our language is neutral. We talk about altered states, um, we talk about experiences, we go into the content of what those things are, so we're not hiding the fact that those things occur but we're framing it in a way that does not trigger all of these associations that people have uh, with the drug war, with substances, with uh, unfortunate kind of uh, 40, 50 years now of uh, societal issues that have come around the substance and others. There's also therefore a reframing of what ketamine is because factually, this is a common drug. Um, ketamine is used more often in normal hospital emergency departments, normal hospital operating rooms than in anything else in the world by significant orders of magnitude. Um, it's a drug that's on the WHO's list of recommended essential drugs. So every country in the world is supposed to carry ketamine in its formulary because of how helpful this is. Uh, in most developing countries, if you don't have an epidural, then ketamine is the drug given during C-sections as the default medication. And so yes, there is this whole aspect of ketamine where it is a drug of, of abuse. Yes, it is a drug use of veterinary medicine. Those are true facts. But focusing on those things, particularly in the common media, on kind of PR pieces or on journalist write-ups, really A, emphasizes the wrong thing, and B, every time those headlines come up, it decreases the likelihood that somebody's going to seek care for a substance that really can make a difference in their lives. And that part's not theory. We know this works. The only debates in the ketamine field at this point are not, does this help people's depression? Does this help people's anxiety? Those are answered, and the answer is yes. The questions are about how do you optimize that treatment? What's the best dose? What's the best frequency? What's the best follow-up? Those are the things that we're honing in on. Not is this going to be successful. And so to us, language becomes access. Can you do this work in a way 
that doesn't scare people, that still focuses on all of the right things that matter, that make a clinical difference, but does so in a way where you actually meet the people, the clients, where they're at. If a person comes to us from a pharmacological background, that's what their docs have talked to them for 40, 50 years about. We speak that language. We talk about NMDA receptors. We talk about GABA interneuron pathways that are affected by this. If somebody approaches us from a more spiritual orientation or a more psychedelic appreciation, we'll talk about set and setting. We'll use those words if that's how the person is going to be best helped by going through this process. We also don't want to push things on people. Um, so much of this psychological experience is about how the person thinks, what the person believes. And the last thing we want to be doing is pushing them in a direction that may not be helpful for them. We don't know these people over the course of years before they meet us. We know these people over the course of days and weeks before they meet us. And so it would be presumptive to be able to tell them, oh, this is what you are going to experience. This is what you're going to feel because each person is going to be unique there. So instead, we put a framework around it. We make sure that they're as comfortable and prepared as possible, but we do so in a way that's not leading them uh, with a specific set of language. As you can tell, this is a kind of passion point of ours. You'll see on our website, we don't mention the word psychedelic. Um, in all of our uh, materials and all of our conversations, it's framed as neutrally as possible because the last thing we want is for somebody who might be benefited from this and, and not subtly benefited, but resolving their depression or resolving their suicidality to be scared away because of some connotations to a language concept that aren't appropriate uh, in all cases. Thank you so much for sharing more about that. I think it's um, that the stigma across the field um, and in mental health in general, but especially as we get into some of these substance-based treatments, I think is is so real and does um, unfortunately, you know, has for years prevented research and continues to prevent people from maybe exploring legal and tested and true options that may be a really great fit for improving their quality of life. Um, I really appreciate that both you you sharing more and how Ember holds that space so that folks know where they can go. Um, right before we started, we were just chatting a little bit about Ember's operations during the pandemic. And I wanted to get to ask you, you know, um, uh, having a long term um, approach to healing and treating depression is really important. I know you mentioned the ecosystem model. I wonder if you could share with us both, you know, what Ember's role has been um, throughout the pandemic and being there for folks and also, um, you know, there have also been some reports of increased abuse of ketamine during the pandemic. And, and maybe if you can share more about kind of how you are um, growing with your, your clients and their needs during this very stressful time for folks. Of course. Um, so really important to understand about this work in general, and we believe this should be true for any provider in this space, is that these are long term people, clients. These are long term care plans. These are not miracles that somebody gets the treatment and never comes back. Of the 400 something people we've uh, helped in the last couple of years, there are less than four of them who have gone a year plus since their initial treatments and not needed to come back. So it's possible, but the norm is that people return on a regular basis. Six weeks is the average duration of antidepressant effect that we've seen for our treatment resistant clients. Um, and that matches the literature on this topic. If you actually look at um, these studies, they're not too many of them, but the ones that have come out about longitudinal care, it's always just a matter of time. And that makes sense for what ketamine does. It's not a preventative treatment. It's a resolution of an acute depressive episode. It stops the depression actively, puts the person back to neutral, but it in no way prevents them from being susceptible to becoming depressed in the future again. It's a drug that's got a 45 minute half-life. So how could it help for years after the fact if it's out of the person's body that quickly? Um, what that means is that these become long-term relationships. These are people we get to know really well. Um, I have clients who knitted blankets for my kids. We get gift cards on a regular basis. These are people whose lives that we've touched and changed, and that becomes really important for the work over time. We are a support system for them. We are a safety net so that whenever their issues do come back, and at some point they will, um, we're there. We can reset them again and they can go back to living their lives in a more fruitful way. During the pandemic, that, mean, that meant that we had to make some really hard choices. So uh, back in March of 2020, we had debated closing. Uh, we were a small practice at the time. It was me and one nurse. Um, my wife and I had a one-year-old. We weren't really sure what was gonna happen. 
Um, and after the first week of being closed, it became very clear from our clients that they needed this. And that made sense for everything they understood. So I actually lived apart from my family for about a month and a half. I came back to New York City. I kept the clinic open uh, by myself. Our, our nurse wasn't working initially. Um, and we made sure that we were there for the people who needed it. Um, that also turned out to be really important for the long run of things. COVID has been deeply difficult uh, for the majority of the world, particularly here in the US. And that has meant that the need for things like ketamine has grown exponentially. Um, the people talk about the fourth wave was the language that was first used about not the acute COVID issues, not the medical consequences of COVID, not the medical consequences of skipping your doctor's visits because you're afraid to go to the hospital, but the mental health burdens of fourth thing that this pandemic has caused. And we've seen that day in and day out. I haven't had an intake call in over a year where somebody hasn't mentioned the pandemic as a stressor, as a trigger for why they're depressed about such a company. Um, that has meant that we've had to grow. And so actually during COVID, we've stayed open, except for that first week. Uh, we worked with the New York City of um, New York Department, New York City Department of Health, as well as follow the CDC and WHO guidelines, so that we've been able to do these treatments in person during the pandemic. And we've also been an outlet for other providers who haven't been able to do that for whatever reason. So um, we actually partnered with Columbia University, the institution here in the city. They had to close their ID program uh, for the duration of COVID. They are still closed, unfortunately. And we've been working with those physicians to see their clients to bridge them through this. So we actually have been. Um, an outlet for places that haven't been able to keep their practices open for whatever reason. Um, in regards to abuse, that has also been a big issue that people have been seeing over the course of the pandemic. So because of the pandemic, there was a marked increase in home use of ketamine or in prescribing ketamine for oral use in a non-supervised way. It's probably a longer discussion than we have time to go into now. That's something that we feel deeply against, that we feel both for medical safety reasons is a bad idea, for clinical advocacy reasons, it only works about 30% of the time, as opposed to the 75% of the time that IV ketamine works. And there's a very, very complicated legal regulatory issue around that with the DEA and different jurisdictions treating that differently. Uh, but what has happened, what we've heard and seen, is that people who have access to this in a non-structured environment have been using it um, in ways that are not consistent with their mental health and wellness, in ways that are more of an abusive pattern um, and less of a supportive pattern for their depression. And we know that ketamine is a drug that causes an altered state. Even with the best structure in place, there will be seek people who seek that altered state, not because it's resolving their depression, but because they like the altered state. Um, and so when you increase access to this uh, in ways that are not structured and supported, in ways that don't really focus on the fact that it could be diverted or misused, um, what happens is that people will misuse it. And, and we've certainly seen that. Uh, in the last year and a half. At Ember, we have rules. We don't prescribe ketamine ever to anybody. We administer it in office. It's a very important distinction. None of our clients have access to the medication outside of this environment that we've set up. Um, and we also work incredibly extensively with people's larger healthcare teams. So they're psychiatrists, they're therapists. And if there ever is a client who we're worried about um, from a misuse standpoint, those are conversations we have up front. So we will treat people who have substance abuse issues. That's actually a relatively common uh, thing for us to work through with an individual. Uh, because substance use is concomitant with depression. People who are depressed often misuse things as an attempt to escape their depression. And so keeping those people away from treatment would also be a harm. Um, but we also are much more careful with those clients than we would with somebody who didn't have a history of using things inappropriately. Um, and that dance has been one that we've uh, become very familiar with in the last couple of years. Wow, that's wonderful. I am grateful that Ember has that lens to be able to uh, both make treatment available and consider sort of the whole picture of someone's safety and well-being um, and bring that in, you know, that ecosystem approach that you mentioned before feels like it makes a lot of healing possible and accessible um, yeah. in, in sort of the wide range of applications that, that ketamine can have or the many ways depression can manifest in someone's life. Um, well, one, um, one final question that I always love to ask um, is sort of a magic wand. You know, if you could make something a part of the fabric of the field, um, broadly defined, you know, mental health, uh, well-being, um, you know, some idea, some technique, some insight, is there something that you would want to instantly ensure was a part of how, um, how the field is operating? 
Yeah, I'm, as you've gathered from the conversation, a rather data-driven person. Um, and if I could flip a switch, uh, there would be a lot more um, rigor uh, in the work that we do in terms of following evidence-based approaches, in terms of collecting that data, because there's still a lot that we're learning in this field that isn't answered yet, um, and really ensuring that all the people who practice this work are doing so uh, following the things that we actually already know are true. Like there is good evidence on dose. There is good evidence on routes of administrations and frequency. And people have a variety of practices that they have in this space. Um, but I would hope that people are uh, more transparent. If I could flip a wand, it would be that many of these uh, nuances are discussed in a lot more detail and are emphasized in a lot more detail. There might be very good reasons for people to vary from things that have really strong clinical evidence for them. Um, but I would hope that that nuance is explored as opposed to kind of waved away. Um, and this work is complicated. Um, this is not writing a prescription and hoping that the patient's gonna take it the way that you told them to at whatever interval. These are really complicated medical interactions. Uh, these are really complicated individualized care plans. No two people have the same duration or frequency that they need to come back and see us. Every client that we work with member, it's an individualized plan that's based on how they're doing. We stay in touch with them forever. And as long as they're feeling okay, they're at a distance, sometimes they have a cycle, the cadence to how often they come back and see us. Um, and there's also the psychological sides of this, which are also nuanced. You no know, two people have the same experience. Some are positive experiences, the majority are positive experiences, and some are negative experiences. Some are difficult sessions that you really need to emphasize and focus on how you can have those safely, how you can do that supportively in a way that even those difficult sessions can cause growth and healing. And so embracing the nuance in the field, embracing the fact that we can learn from what people are doing, and there are tens of thousands of people who are getting these treatments, um, but we only have hundreds of people in these clinical trials and in this kind of data collection systems that have currently existed. And to answer your question kind of succinctly, if I could wave a wand, it would be that we learn from all of the people that are in this process actively and kind of refine what we do so that we can help even more. This already works in three out of four people if you believe the clinical trials and about 82% of our clients here at Ember, and we measure that very succinctly. Um, and the fact that that number could be even better, the fact that if we do these things in a more kind of uh, rigorous way from learning about how to maximize these treatments that more than eight out of 10 people can benefit from this is really hopeful to me. It means that we actually might have a tool that just works. And so the real question is, how do you make it work? as optimally as possible. Mm. Wow, that is so incredibly inspiring. And I'm very grateful um, that you're, you and the team at Ember Health are getting to figure this out to not only you know, find what works best in this ecosystem approach, but to document it, to generate that data. Yeah. Um, I am excited to, to keep learning from your insights and very grateful that you've shared them with our community today. Of course. Um, thank you so much for joining me. It's been my absolute pleasure, Jen. Um, people should know that at any point, they're welcome to reach out. So everything with us here at Ember starts with a conversation. Um, all clients have a conversation with one of our doctors, usually me at this point in time. Um, and the whole point of that first interaction is to learn more. Uh, we don't kind of assume that we know why a person's reaching out to us. We hear about them. We inform them about how this does work from our understanding. Um, and so everything begins with talking about it going into some of that, how this could be helpful for them, or, or maybe not. Um, not every person is appropriate for this, but it all starts with that conversation. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm guessing that we will have a lot of viewers reaching out um, and benefiting from, from your wisdom. Thank you for making this a safe space for people to find healing. Of course, it's been my absolute pleasure. Wonderful. We'll have a great rest of the day. Today's interview was with Dr. Nicholas Grunman, the founder of Ember Health. Ember Health provides IV infusions of ketamine in a safe, medically monitored setting to people seeking relief from depression. They work in partnerships with mental health providers to author this service in conjunction with and as a complement to the kinds of services that more traditional mental health providers use with their patients. Dr. Grundman is an emergency medicine physician by training devoted to improving how healthcare systems operate for those who need it most. 
working in emergency rooms from suburban California to inner city New York to rural West Virginia, Nico grew frustrated by how frequently he was treating acute symptoms of mental health without helping his patients with more sustained long-term solutions. Many years of working with ketamine as a safe medicine for sedation prompted continuous research of the drug's efficacy for other conditions, including depression. Nico co-founded Ember Health as a way to help individuals take control of their lives and contribute to the shaping of a field in line with his values. Dr. Grunman pursued his residency training at Kings County Hospital, SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, New York, and received his medical degree and master's in business administration from Stanford University. He lives in Brooklyn with his wife and family.